Good evening. My name is David Byrne. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Medical Sciences, and I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's Insight Virtual Lecture, which is called Tales from the Biomedical Frontier. We pride ourselves in the quality and the reach of our research, and also its real world impact, as well as on our communication skills. I'd like to thank Michelle Miller from our digital skills team, and also Duncan Yellowlees and Ray Gauk Roger, who advised on presentation skills, and Dr. Richie Hetherington, who helped advise on content and organises this type of training and development opportunity for all of our research students. Our doctoral students have competed for the opportunity to speak at this public lecture this evening. 22 of our best presenters were nominated by academic supervisors and colleagues, and seven were carefully selected to go forward into the semi-final. Over 500 of you voted for the talk you most wanted to hear, and three finalists were selected by a combination of the public vote and a panel that comprised academics and also public engagement experts. As you can imagine, it was a really difficult task to pick three finalists and a very close run competition. And I'd like to give my congratulations to the four runners up who were Hannah Salmonovich, James Faraday, Cameron Kirk, and also Anna Robinson, who each presented fantastic talks. So that brings us now to tonight, and it's my pleasure to introduce our three winners. Artificial Intelligence for Sepsis, Prediction Save Lives by Nihal Hassan. Is Muscle Weakness Getting on Your Nerves by Stuart Maitland. And Turning the Tides, Using Bacteria to Vaccinate Against Disease by Bethany Gollan. I'll be back after the lectures for a live question and answer session. But in the meantime, if you'd like to submit a question, then you can do so via the YouTube live chat box, which is on your screen, or also via Twitter using the hashtag at InsightsNCL. I hope you enjoy the evening. I'm Nihar Hassan, a PhD student, and I would like to start my talk with you today with a question. In your opinion, which of these conditions take more lives in the British community every year? Is it breast cancer, sepsis, stroke, prostate cancer, or bowel cancer? Let me tell you the correct answer. Surprisingly, it's sepsis. Sepsis is also known as blood poisoning. It can be caused by any microorganism, but bacteria are the most common cause for sepsis, particularly resistant strains. It starts when our immune system's response to an infection goes wrong and starts to attack its own tissues and organs. It can be provoked by something as simple as an untreated cut or as serious as an unhealing surgical wound. It's a life-threatening condition that requires prompt diagnosis and aggressive treatment. However, this is not always the case in real practice. Early detection of sepsis is very difficult. And this is because early symptoms usually overlap with other existing acute conditions, such as heart or kidney failure, making sepsis detection only possible at very late stages, when it is too late to save a life. That's why we call it the hidden killer. Another reason why we call sepsis the hidden killer is that it kills people, people more than what we may think. Every year, sepsis takes lives of people more than breast cancer, prostate cancer, and bowel cancer all together. Sepsis kills the economy as it does with people. It costs the UK economy every year about 16 billion pounds, while sepsis prevention can save the NHS about 170 million pounds. So, for an average sized hospital, if you can take off sepsis from this hospital, you can make a saving about 1 million pounds, which can be used for novel treatment techniques or diagnostic strategies. But is sepsis a real problem? 
why don't we give a combination of the strongest antibiotics that we have for the high-risk patients and that's it. I wish it was so simple, but our currently available antibiotics are suffering from significant resistance that is classified as one of the leading global health problems by the WHO. You may think, why don't we develop new antibiotics instead of the ones that we are losing? Developing novel antibiotics with new mechanisms of action is a very complicated and costly process that we don't have new antibiotics in the pipelines since 1984 till present. Does this mean that we don't have any hope for survival? Is it the end of the world? Can we catch this hidden killer and live our life peacefully and safely without sepsis? The answer is there is still some hope for survival. Thanks for computers and artificial intelligence, we can now predict sepsis even before its occurrence. When people hear about predictions, they just think about fairy tales. They don't exist in our world. However, these fairy tales highlight the human curiosity to change their future roles for the better. Artificial intelligence is able to convert these fairy tales into reality. And we can say, see this in applications that are changing our daily lives, such as applications predicting weather or predict, predicting routes. Predictions have been a question in medicine as well. And here is where my project lies. Here is where ASIPS lies. ASIPS is my artificial intelligence model that can predict the likelihood of infection and sepsis in patients undergoing surgery. I chose surgical patients particularly because they are at the highest risk of sepsis. Developing a predictive AI model is just like cooking with your very own secret recipe. The first step is picking up the risk factors or what we call the predictors that you will use to train the model. These predictors are selected carefully from the existing literature and they represent the specific flavor for your model that will differ from any other previous de previously developed model. But there are some considerations that you should take when you are selecting these predictors. The first consideration is that these predictors should match a high accuracy and precision, and this can be known through advanced statistical methods. The second consideration is that these predictors should have some clinical relevance based on the purpose of your model. And the third consideration is that you should give preference for predictors that have modifiable or controllable nature, such as blood glucose level or blood pressure. This will allow your model to provide recommendations to reduce risk of a condition from occurring, rather than giving just a numerical nonsense estimations. This is in contrast to non-modifiable risk factors, such as gender or age. But how is ASIPS developed? ASIPS development passes through three stages. The first stage is picking up the predictors through digging the literature for all the articles that develop AI predictive models for sepsis. After selecting these predictors, we extract them from a big data set of patients who had previous surgery and got sepsis afterwards. These selected predictors will then be used uh, by a statistical analysis in order to identify the most significant ones to be used for the model training. In stage 3, after the development of the model, we will use the background and expertise of clinicians in order to explore their perception towards the predictive models and how they can guide their clinical decision making. So what we have achieved here now. Stage 1 has been completed and we have selected 13 specific predictors out of 194 predictors that were previously used in other models. These 13 predictors are expected to improve the accuracy and precision of ASIPS. Out of these 13 predictors, we were able to classify 7 of them as modifiable predictors, which will allow us uh, to give recommendations in order to reduce the risk of sepsis further. 
In stage two, we will take these predictors and run them through a statistical analysis in order to identify the best set of predictors that will be used further for the training purpose of ASIPs. And in stage three, we will use the perception of clinicians for further improvement of ASIPs before its application in a real clinical practice to guarantee the best results from ASIPs. You may still be hesitant about how ASIPs work and if it is of real benefit for patients or not. Then, you need to hear the story of the 65 years old lady who was referred to the surgical team and they decided that she needs an elective operation. Unfortunately, the surgeons at that time didn't have ASIPs to calculate the risk of sepsis for this lady after the operation and she looked quite healthy for a successful operation. The operation was done successfully, but unfortunately, a few days later, the lady was given a diagnosis of sepsis. The surgeon decided to take samples from her blood and the surgical site to be sent to the lab for analysis, and the results came back with resistant bugs. They tried to give her a combination of the strongest antibiotics that they had, and she was admitted to the ICU due to her deteriorating condition, but sadly, she never returned back home for her loving grandchild. ASIPs can have a totally different ending for the same story. The same lady who is 65 years old and was referred to the surgical team who decided that she needs an elective operation, but this time the surgeons had ASIPs to calculate the risk of sepsis after the operation. ASIPs estimated a risk of sepsis for this particular lady as 60% after operation. However, ASIPs also recommended that Controlling her blood pressure and controlling her anemia would reduce this risk to 20%. The surgeons found the recommendations of ASIPs helpful and doable. They also had more time to discuss this risk with the patient. Finally, they decided to follow the recommendations of ASIPs and the surgery was done successful without the diagnosis of sepsis. The patient was admitted to the ward and then she was returned back home safely without sepsis diagnosis or without any other morbidities. But does this mean that AI models will substitute human clinicians? The answer is a big no, because the purpose of AI models is to contribute to a better clinical care and to improve the patient's engagement in the process of shared clinical decision making so that we can obtain better outcomes of the treatment strategies. Although AI models can perform multiple activities, but they can never replace the care and willingness of human clinicians. So to wrap up, ASIPs can save the time of clinicians for better clinical care and more interaction with their patients. It can save a lot of money that is wasted by sepsis infections. It can reserve the finite resources that are exhausted by sepsis and prolonged hospitalization due to sepsis. It can be a smart solution for antimicrobial resistance and slowing down the coming pandemic of antimicrobial resistance. It can also open the gates for further applications of AI models in other clinical conditions. And finally, and most importantly, it represents the predictions that can change our future and save our lives. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Stuart Maitland. I'm a junior doctor and a research fellow at Newcastle University, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the subject of my PhD and asking you an important question. Is muscle weakness getting on your nerves? Now, as you know, we're in the midst of a global pandemic. This is an important disease which mainly affects the older generation, mostly occurs in the community, although it is an important reason for admission to hospital. It's of growing international concern and governments are starting to realise the importance of this disease and how they can manage and treat it. And it has a huge economic burden as well. I am of course talking about sarcopenia. But what is sarcopenia? This is one of these unnecessary medical Latinisms. Sarco meaning muscle, penia lack of, lack of muscle. Now we all lose strength as we grow older and some lose an awful lot more than others. Sarcopenia 
is when that muscle strength loss starts to affect your day-to-day -day life. And mainly, the key thing I want to get across is that sarcopenia affects the muscles of the trunk and torso, and we'll come back to why that's important shortly. Now, if we look at strength through the life course, we start off as children, building up strength very quickly, up to a peak between the age of about 27 and 30, the age I'm at at the moment, and then unfortunately for me, it's all downhill from there. But that muscle loss tends to accelerate above the age of 50. And above the age of 50, we tend to lose between two and 4% of our muscle strength every year. That's a huge amount to be losing when that's compounding year after year. You can see how that would quickly affect your life. But it also has a wide variability as well. So some are much more affected than others. And even if you take the fittest of the fit, retired Olympic athletes, as one study in Japan did, and look at them above the age of 65, although fewer of the Olympic athletes developed sarcopenia, some still did. So this is clearly an important disease that's going to affect a large number of us. So let's talk about the clinical impact of sarcopenia. Now, the key thing is that you lose independence. If you haven't got the strength to be able to get up, to wash and dress yourself, to do your cooking, your cleaning, you're going to lose independence. And that's a huge hit for a lot of patients. You're more likely to fall. And if you do fall, you're more likely to fracture a bone as well. If you do end up in hospital, it will be for longer. Um, and the costs of taking care of you in and out of hospital will be much higher as well. Your rehabilitation to get you back to your normal function is extremely challenging for the physiotherapists, for the occupational therapists who are involved. And like I say, this is a very variable disease as well. So there's the, young, the oldest bodybuilder I could find on Google Images, um, and above him is uh, very much how I felt in the middle of lockdown. Unable to get out of the chair, unable to get up and do very much there. The key thing I want to get across to you today is that strength isn't just about muscles. And we know that this is the case because in illnesses like sarcopenia, if you give patients steroids, that doesn't build up the muscle as you would expect it to. And such as bodybuilders might take steroids to build up the muscle. That just doesn't work for sarcopenia. And you can lose muscle at a um, very high rate, but you can lose strength even faster. So if you were to break a bone, you'd lose an awful lot of strength very quickly. But you lose strength a lot faster than you lose muscle. So in older people, the muscle mass is there, but it's just not working properly. And the opposite is true. So if you take younger people who are training and building up muscle, they tend to build up strength an awful lot faster than they build up muscle. So there's something going on there that we're able to make this muscle operate more efficiently. Now, we know that lots of things go into muscle health. We've already talked a bit about if you were to end up in hospital and to be bed, bed bound, that you'd lose a lot of strength. And this can be at a phenomenal rate, up to 10% strength loss per week in hospital. And the opposite is true as well. If you're able to do good quality resistance exercises with a weight that's appropriate to your ability, you can help to maintain some of that strength and help prevent sarcopenia from coming on. We also know that diet is very important as well and getting in enough calories, but also especially getting in enough protein. And that's something that a lot of us miss out on. Heart health is another very important factor, making sure that your heart is healthy, to be able to pump blood around your body, to supply the muscles with blood and oxygen. But even these three things don't explain all of that variability in muscle loss and strength loss that we've talked about. Now, given that muscles are controlled by nerves, we set out to see what happens as we lose nerves, as we grow older, what happens to the muscle that's left behind. And we aimed to measure the different nerves as they travel down the, pa the pathways and how they control your muscles. So the nerves of the human body are laid out very much like a roadmap. So let's imagine that you're trying to drive home from Edinburgh to Newcastle. You can take the direct route via the A1, that will get you the home the quickest. But what if there's a lane closed? What if there's a traffic jam? You might end up being diverted and coming down the M6 instead. Now, 
don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with going there, it's just not the most direct route to get back. And it's very much the same with the nerves that supply your muscles. You've got your corticospinal tract, which is your very fast A1 pathway. It's direct, it gets, that's the one that you mainly use. But you've also got these backup pathways, and one of these is the reticulospinal tract. And that's your backup, indirect M6 pathway. It's there, it's not used as much, but it's also very important as well. Now what we know about this reticular spinal indirect pathway is that it particularly controls the muscles of the trunk and torso, which you remember from earlier, that's the same muscles as are affected in sarcopenia. So given this was the case, we set out to measure these two pathways and their impact on strength as we grow older. So I got 85 participants, members of the public, uh, on my rowing machine. They participated in the experiment where they would do a rowing task while I activated some of their pathways. And we'll talk about how we did that. So here's an example subject who sat on the rowing machine. Uh, he's got electrodes attached to both biceps to measure the response in the muscles. And we're measuring that on both sides. Um, and then what we're doing is we're going to apply transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is a whopping great electromagnet that you put above the brain and you fire it. That's going to activate the brain, send a signal down the spine to the muscle. It's going to activate your muscle. And then with those electrodes we've attached, we can measure that response down your very fast corticospinal A1 tract and via your backup indirect reticular spinal pathway. And because we can measure both of these, we can measure how much of each one you're using. So if we look at the total nerve supply as we grow older, we know that we lose nerve supply to the muscles. That's a given. So there was a reduction in that nerve supply between younger and older individuals. However, there really wasn't much there between people who were stronger and people who had less strength. But when you start to pick apart those two pathways, you find a really interesting difference. You find that younger people are using their reticular spinal backup pathway an awful lot more. And we think this is their way of being able to uh, do their day to day activities just to keep going, uh, to be able to, to carry the shopping and things like that. Whereas older people tend to, tended to use their backup reticular spinal pathway an awful lot less. So we think this is because this backup pathway has also been lost. So the hypothesis that we're putting together is that your reticular spinal tract is your safety net. So if you can't use your main A1, you have your M6 backup pathway. But if you haven't got either pathway, you're going to lose function, you're gonna get stuck. The next thing that we looked at was the junction between the nerves and the muscles. And we know that sometimes these messages just don't get through between nerve and muscle. So we put in a very fine needle into the muscle to record the electrical activity directly. And the arrangement of the muscle, it's very much like spaghetti. You've got these long, thin strands. Each strand is controlled by a nerve. Um, and those strands all activate together to pull and contract and move an arm or a leg or whatever it is that's moving. And in fact, the only difference between muscle and spaghetti, apart from that one moves, is that spaghetti is about 10 times larger than a muscle fibre. So we're really operating on a very fine scale here. So we built a new device which has a whole grid of electrodes that enables us to build up a picture of the electrical activity in the muscle. Now this is a work in progress but we're hoping this device will help us be able to pick apart diseases that affect the muscle and the nerve including motor neuron disease and sarcopenia. Now we're hoping that both of these experiments will help us guide future treatments for sarcopenia. What we're aiming to do is to build devices that will reinforce your reticular spinal tract, reinforce that backup pathway. So we're working on an automated trainer that will help to improve that function and we're working on ways to directly stimulate your reticular spinal pathway, to reinforce it, to build that up so that you've got that backup pathway. 
hopefully to prevent or treat sarcopenia. What can we do to build our strength as we grow older? I talked about this earlier, but I want to highlight it again. Doing good quality resistance exercises with a weight that's appropriate to your ability. And that can be lifting weights, that can be going to yoga classes, whatever you're able to do. And getting a good enough diet as well. Making sure you get a good diet with enough calories, but especially enough protein. It's very important for all of us as we grow older. So to summarise, I asked you at the start, is muscle weakness getting on your nerves? I hope I've shown you muscle weakness. Yes, it is getting on your nerves, but it's something we hope to be able to do something about. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Bethany. I'm a PhD student here at Newcastle University and I'm also a research technician working in vaccine development. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Now I put this slide here thinking about how I could best explain the need for vaccines and how I can include the many ways in which disease could impact our lives. But I don't think I need to. The last year has been incredibly difficult for all of us and our lives have been altered more than most thought possible because of a virus. Images like we see here are becoming more and more mainstream. Well, this far right hand image shows the Ebola epidemic that began only seven years ago and has claimed thousands of lives and it continues to claim lives. These other two images are now part of our everyday thanks to coronavirus, where countless jobs have been lost, lives have been altered and most importantly, lives have been lost. Over the last year, we've learned many things. We've learned how important family and friends are. We've learned that some people didn't know how to wash their hands properly and we've learned the importance of vaccines. At a time where it felt like everything just stood still, all of our hopes lay with vaccines. So I want to talk to you a little bit about how we as humans deal with germs. So germs are everywhere. They're all around us every day as well as in our bodies. And the body has a number of ways to defend itself against infection including physical barriers, like the skin, that ha stop harmful germs from entering our body in the first place. When these defences fail, our immune system takes charge. So the important part of the immune system for the purpose of vaccines is the adaptive immune system. And it's called adaptive because it does just that. The cells of the adaptive immune system are constantly learning and adapting to each new challenge that it faces. It's a highly efficient and specific branch of the immune system. So if we look at one of these components of the adaptive immune system and look at the B cell. The B cell is best known for producing antibodies. Antibodies are really important in the killer response to a threat such as a bacteria or a virus. And I'm going to use virus as an example throughout today, but please just keep in the back of your mind but this also applies to bacteria and even parasites. Now antibodies are very specific. They're not just specific to one virus, which is our example, but they're specific to a component of the virus known as an antigen. This is a small part of the virus which is recognised by a specific antibody. The number one role of an antibody is to bind to its specific antigen. So in this case, it's the antigen that we find on the surface of our virus. So antibodies can work in a number of ways. Neutralising antibodies bind to these really specific antigens in a way that blocks the virus from entering our cells. And by doing this, these antibodies interrupt the life cycle of the virus. Unlike bacteria, viruses need to enter into our cells to survive. So by preventing this, we can protect against the virus. These neutralising antibodies are key in the protection against viruses. Antibodies can also stick together while also stuck to the virus and this is called agglutination. This creates these weird clumps of viruses and antibodies and it both immobilises the virus and it also makes the clump nice and easy for other members of the immune system to clear. Another way that antibodies can help to fight against infection is by tagging the virus for destruction by other members of the immune system. Essentially, putting a big sticker on it that instructs the immune system to destroy the virus. And just when you think we're done, 
Antibodies can also cause the formation of membrane attack complexes in the surface of the virus. This is as bad as it sounds for the virus. It pretty much just punches a hole in the side of the virus and kills it. We think like sinking a ship. So what I hope you've gotten from this so far is that our immune system is amazing, but also that generating antibodies against harmful viruses is certainly in our interest. So when the body encounters an antigen for the first time, so say if it's never seen this particular virus before, it takes time for the body to produce specific immune cells to recognise its antigens, and therefore it takes time for the adaptive immune system to kill the virus. This delay gives the virus a head start. Although there are other less specific elements of the immune system that will kick in, the real killing force of our immune system is still on the sidelines. And in the meantime, the person that all of this has taken place within is falling ill. So where do vaccines come into this? Vaccines can introduce these specific antigens to the immune system before the body encounters a real virus. So if we use Ebola virus as our example, it will introduce Ebola virus specific antigens to our immune system without our patient actually being infected with the disease causing live Ebola virus. So the delay in building up the trained adaptive immune system therefore doesn't make them fall ill with Ebola and that is a great thing. So vaccines are essentially a training manual for our immune system. This means that if the person was then to encounter the disease further down the line, such as Ebola virus, the immune system will then be able to swiftly dispatch the virus before it can cause any harm. And this is known as a protective response. So there are lots of really clever ways that vaccines can work. They can deliver a weakened form of our target, our bacteria or virus that's unable to cause disease. They can contain the blueprint for an antigen or they can contain an inactive part of the target which contains antigens. The way that I'm interested in delivering antigens is for them to be produced by weakened bacteria. So if I were to take, for example, this antigen that we would find on the surface of Ebola virus, I can insert the antigen DNA, so essentially our antigen blueprint, into a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid. And this is a way of packaging our antigen DNA. We can then put this plasmid, which contains our DNA encoding our antigen, into our weakened bacteria. By giving the bacteria the blueprint for this antigen, we've essentially taught it how to produce a tiny fragment of Ebola virus. It's a very small part and it's not a live virus, so there's no risk of developing Ebola symptoms and we're not introducing live Ebola virus at all. So this gives us a vaccine and it not only produces the antigen for us, but it also takes it straight to the immune system, which is where we want it. Because it's in the very nature of bacteria to divide and survive, that's exactly what they'll do. And they'll be producing our Ebola antigens as it goes. But remember that this bacteria has been weakened, so it shouldn't cause disease, and it survives for a relatively short time compared to healthy bacteria. So there we have it. This is our vaccine. We have our live, weakened bacteria producing our Ebola antigens for us. The introduction of the Ebola antigen by our bacterial vaccine that we've just produced kickstarts the production of specific B cells and therefore the ability to produce specific antibodies against Ebola. This means that if further down the line the live virus were to enter the body, so if our patient were to come into contact with live Ebola virus, then the B cells are ready. They're primed to produce antibodies that kill the virus swiftly before it causes any damage. So the example I've shown here is of a single antigen. However, in practice, this is rarely the case. If we were to do exactly the same thing, but with a stretch of DNA that encodes multiple antigens, we get a bacterial vaccine that produces multiple antigens. In turn, this generates a team of complementary B cells that are specific to different antigens on our target. So specific to different antigens of Ebola virus. And this gives us a really efficient killing machine. It also gives us a little bit of security in case our virus were to develop mutations in one of these antigens. 
So why do I use bacteria to create these vaccines? There's always drawbacks with using a live vaccine. So even though our bacteria are weakened, if someone were to have a really, really damaged immune system, then this wouldn't be an appropriate vaccine to give. But what are the benefits? You may have seen in the news a lot lately that many vaccines need to be kept really, really cold. And we're not talking cool bag and ice pack like you're going on a picnic, we're talking up to 80 degrees below freezing. And we've seen how difficult this was to arrange in this country. Now imagine trying to keep an Ebola vaccine that cold in remote regions of sub-Saharan Africa, or in a refugee centre, or in a country at war. One of the reasons that I think these vaccines have huge potential is because they don't need this cold storage. They don't need to be transported in a freezer. You could just pop them in a backpack. And imagine how much more accessible this would make these vaccines. Now I imagine within your lifetime, most of you have had a vaccination at some stage, whether as a child or to travel. We probably all associate vaccinations with injections. Not only is this probably not that pleasant, but it can create problems for those develop delivering the vaccine. And this includes things like the safe disposal of needles and the risk of needle stick injury. The difference with the vaccines that we've produced here is that they can be given in a tablet form instead. So vaccines are also really expensive to make. But because bacteria can multiply and divide all on their own, these vaccines have the potential to be a lot cheaper to manufacture. But I'm not just in this to save people money. Perhaps the greatest potential benefit of these vaccines is that they could be hugely more accessible to everyone, regardless of circumstances that are beyond their control. Hopefully this can help a lot of people and save a lot of lives. So I've used Ebola virus throughout as an example, and that's because I am a little bit biased. Not only is Ebola a really important and very scary virus, it's also something I've worked on quite a bit. The process I've shown you today is not just hypothetical. I have created this vaccine against this Ebola virus using exactly the steps I've shown you today. Now I don't claim to be saving the world just yet, there's a lot of testing that comes after this point and that's what we're currently doing. As I said earlier, this isn't limited to viruses. Although I'm very early on in my career, I've been really lucky to work on multiple projects using this method or a slightly different version to create five potential vaccines where targets include viruses, bacteria and parasites. So I just want to leave you with one last thought. I've talked about Ebola today. Ebola can kill up to 90% of those that it infects and causes catastrophic internal bleeding. Because Ebola virus is spread through bodily fluids, it was possible, although difficult, to contain. But imagine if Ebola spread as easily as COVID, or the flu, or if COVID had the fatality rate of Ebola. Thankfully that hasn't happened, but we do have to be prepared because we don't know what the future holds. The ability to produce effective vaccines quickly is key in that preparation. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my talk today. I really hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Great. Well, good evening to you all. I think there is a very healthy audience watching this tonight, and I'm sure you would agree with me that we've just seen three fantastic and very contrasting talks from Nihal, Bethany and from Stuart. Um, and we're hoping that um, they will have stimulated you to be putting some questions into the chat, which we will try and get through as quickly as possible um, before we wrap up in a few minutes time. So um, we have going to quickly kick off um, with a question actually for Stuart, which comes from Mike. Um, are the results affected by gender, Stuart? 
Yes, it's interesting. There's there's definitely a difference in terms of the strength levels between men and women. Um, and that can be a difference of about kind of uh, five, ten percent. Um, and that that's that's uh, the way that we adjusted our grip strength was to standardize that for uh, age and for sex. Um, so we took that into account for when we were setting the cutoffs for when people had reduced strength. Um, it was all in proportion to a man or woman of their age as well. So that was, it was definitely built into there. Um, I don't think we've quite got enough participants to be able to kind of pick out that um, uh, men or women were uh, particularly one side or the other. Um, but I think what this is showing is that this is something that, that affects us all as well. Yeah, yeah. I have to say, I, I was extremely depressed watching the decline with age because I'm not going to declare my age, but it was certainly at the point where you said it started to deteriorate more rapidly. So uh, I have to keep going with the exercises. Um, uh, Nihal, I, a question for yourselves come in. Uh, I don't have a name on, on the questionnaire, but it's an interesting one. Um, obviously, AI is such a topical thing at the moment and, and, and what the learning capability, if you will, of the systems are. Um, is it possible for the programme that you described to consider or go back to other factors that were not originally included? I guess it's referring to is the system able to learn if you will um, and, and and find therefore other factors that could be important in modeling and predicting yeah this is a very interesting question actually the answer is yes because and we can detect this in the phase of the learning of the model of the uh, how we teach the model, how to differentiate between septic and non-septic patients. So we can get the model to tell us that this factor that was not previously considered by other uh, models would be a good predictor and would improve the sensitivity and specificity of predicting sepsis. So um, this explains and highlights the importance of big data and collecting a large number yeah. of patients and large number of variables in order not to miss any uh, possible uh, uh, variables that can improve the predictive power of the model. Uh, the, the good thing with our model is that it's informed from the previous literature. So we have included the most potential predictors that can improve the sensitivity and specificity of the model. But definitely we are including also another factors that we are expecting the model would tell us that these factors would be much better or would improve the prediction power of the model itself. Great answer. Thank you very much, Nihal. That's great. Now, again, we've got a, another one for um, Bethany, um, which I'm going to have to read out pretty well verbatim. Uh, Bethany, it's a slightly technical question, and I want to try and make it clear so the audience can, can absolutely um, hear what's been asked. It's a good question. Is there a way of controlling and checking the consistency of the bacterially produced vaccine antigens Presumably the sequence could mutate and the antigens might not be as expected. Might it be possible for the bacteria to produce novel antigens that could help protect, protect against a mutating virus? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, so as a short answer, the bacteria should only produce what we give it to produce. We can do some really cool things and we can sort of fuse our antigen with different parts of DNA so we can affect the delivery and how the antigen is presented. But the antigen itself shouldn't mutate between us giving the vaccine and the bacteria being killed. Because remember, the bacteria are weakened. So mutations are a part of evolution and they occur between generations. And because our bacteria are weakened, they won't go through multiple generations. So there's a really, really low risk of mutation. But it also is an added benefit of having a section of DNA that has multiple antigens encoded. Um, but looking at sort of novel antigens, there is something that bacteria do quite often do when you sort of give them an antigen to produce, is that they produce sort of very small, almost bite-sized antigens, which are actually quite potently immunogenic. So it's quite a nice little effect that they have there. Great, fantastic answer. Thank you very much, yeah, Bethany, that's brilliant. Um, we've got another one in, in here for Stuart, which I'm sure will resonate with a lot out there in the audience who um, are keeping themselves uh, fit and healthy. So Stuart, um, eating protein and resistance exercises will help to keep the muscles strong, but does it change the neural pathway that's used? 
Um, and are there any ways to directly support or train our bodies to continue to use the nerves we use when we are younger? That's an interesting one. Yeah, absolutely. Really interesting question. I suppose we all want something that we can uh, do something about with regards to this kind of uh, strength loss. Um, I would say that these neural mechanisms are your safety net. Um, and it's still very important to look after your muscles as well. Um, so definitely uh, keeping up that diet with enough protein and a balanced diet to be able to, to keep your muscles healthy so that you don't have to necessarily rely on these backup pathways would be your first bet. Um, I think that in terms of exercise, um, the best thing that you can be looking to do are uh, good exercises that uh, may help to condition this reticular spinal tract. So as I said in my talk, this is the reticular spinal tract is involved in your balance, your gait, your posture. So if you've got exercises that are exercising those, uh, I'm thinking about things like yoga, um, mm -hmm. that kind of exercise, that's, go that's going to be activating and stimulating your reticular spinal tract. But it's also, uh, going back to my first point, that's going to be improving your muscle tone as well. So you're kind of getting a double benefit from it. Great. Thanks very much, Stuart. Excellent. Well, we've got a few questions piling in now. So um, thanks to the audience uh, for keeping these questions um, coming. Um, so this one's for Nihal. So um, is AISPS already being used in hospital settings? And, and what's your hope for the future of the new model, Nihal? Okay, thank you for this question. Uh, we are still at an early stage of uh, the research. So for a model to be applied in the clinical practice, it has to pass through three stages, the development, the validation and the testing. We are still in the development phase. And our hope in the future that uh, we can learn during the testing phase uh, more about uh, making this uh, predictive model more uh, effective and uh, have more contribution in the clinical care process of patients. Uh, and it starts to be applied in, in the hospital setting and find how much it would impact uh, the patient's outcomes. Great. Thank you, Nial. That's excellent. And then uh, another one for you, Bethany. This is really interesting and a, a real topical one. Um, um, would it be possible for the coronavirus vaccine to be given in tablet form in the future? Goodness. <laughs> Very topical, yes. Um, so in theory, yes, that, that would absolutely be possible. It's obviously something that we'd have to have a lot of work put into it. I won't go into details of any sort of ongoing projects or potential projects, but there's no reason why that shouldn't be possible in the future. But yeah, for now, we have some very good vaccines available, but certainly in the future, it would be an option. Great. OK, well, that's it. That, that's very honest and upfront, and that would be a fantastic thing. Um, so, OK, there's another one coming in for Stuart. Um, do you think sarcopenia is a result of or at least related to wider social issues such as, oh, interesting, such as loneliness and isolation, Stuart? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really interesting thought there. Um, I think one of the things that's really good that we do at Newcastle is certainly from going to medical school here, you're always taught to look at very much the wider issues surrounding disease. It's not just about disease, it's about the person. Um, and I think that is definitely the case for sarcopenia. If you've not got a reason to be getting out of the house and exercising, then you're going to be losing that, that muscle strength. Yeah. Um, I won't tell you how many GPs I've worked with who've said, I wish I could prescribe a dog. <laughs> yes, that's a good one. Absolutely. Well, I think I think that uh, that that, that the, the, the canine prescription could be very good. Can I just ask you a question myself? Um, why did you select the reticular spinal tract and not one of the other non corticospinal pathways, like the tectospinal or rubrospinal pathways? Um, I think that it's it's matching up what's what's interesting with what's what's possible is uh, is is is, is uh, where we're at. So we've found some really interesting ways to activate the reticular spinal tract um, that was um, a lot more it, uh, up the other tract, so a bit more difficult to, to activate. Um, whereas we, we, we'd we found a particular activity with this kind of cued rowing that was able to kind of uh, activate the reticular spinal pathway. Um, that was combined with some uh, previous research from my supervisor showing that it was involved and interesting in terms of strength 
um, and that was what kind of cued us to to go down that that path. Great, that's, well, that's very nice, nice answer. Okay, um, now we've got uh, another question come in from a uh, John, and thank you for this, John, uh, for Bethany. Um, could you vaccinate against more than one target disease in the same bacteria? Uh, yes, that is possible. So we call them sort of multivalent vaccines. So it is possible to include antigens for multiple different targets within one sort of bacterial vector. That is doable, yes. Excellent, excellent. And then um, a nice answer. And then in for Nihal, um, how did you manage to come? Oh, how did you manage to continue your research during the pandemic, Nihal? Okay, uh, thank you for this question. Actually, it's a difficult time for everybody, not only for researchers. Um, but as you know, um, it's all about the goal of your research. If you if you really want to do something that would help people, you will just work out uh, to find solutions uh, around the pandemic and just continue your work. Uh, not all the work is uh, inside the hospital. Some of the work is uh, on the data, office-based. So that's what we are doing currently, as everybody's doing. <laughs> That's a that's a nice answer, and I, I kind of guessed as much. You could do some remote working there. That's good, um, and then gosh, we're getting some really topical questions here, which is fantastic. So, Stuart, I'm not sure you can probably see this, but I'll read it out for the audience, and I'm sure many can empathise with this one. Do you think lockdown restrictions will have resulted in an acceleration in sarcopenia? What do you expect the fallout from this to be? Yeah, really interesting. Um, I think it's it's definitely going to have a huge domino effect in terms of um, uh, directly. You, we talked about loneliness and people not able to get out of the house and do their activities. Um, socially, there's not the same support for patients as you would normally expect. Um, but uh, I mean, if I can uh, relate this with an anecdote, um, when I was working in the hospital last year, one of the things that we saw quite a lot was... Um, patients coming out of their houses for the uh, Thursday evening clapping um, and actually falling over and injuring themselves at uh. that point because actually that, that's the first point at which they'd maybe gone out of the house in quite a while. Um, and, and so there was often a, a surge of admissions on a Thursday night uh, related to that. Um, so I think that, that lockdowns definitely had, had an impact and I think we're going to be uh, uh, trying to resolve that for quite a while. Thank, thank you, Stuart. That's a really that's a really interesting anecdote as well. That really is amazing. Um, and I guess when you think about it, it's sadly rather predictable. And um, we have one last question, and that a pleasure goes to you, Bethany. Um, how long do you anticipate the testing process will take for your new Ebola vaccine? <laughs> it's a little bit like how long's a piece of string. I, I, think. I was just um, going to say that. Surely, is that. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a lot of factors that will sort of dedicate um, how long this will take because it depends on which vaccination route we end up going down, how many vaccinations are needed to elicit a full immune response and how many tweaks we need to make along the way. So unfortunately, I don't have a straightforward answer for that. Um, it's very much a process that evolves as we go, depending on how the vaccine behaves and how many modifications we need to make to get a really good immune res response that can hopefully help a lot of people. Well, I think that's a, that's a very wise answer and a very honest one at that. As you say, science never goes smoothly always. So um, thank you for that. Um, so that does bring us to the end of uh, the proceedings for this evening. So it just remains for me to thank Nihal, Stuart and Bethany for their brilliant lectures uh, based on some fabulous and really interesting research questions um, and for tackling a lot of questions here tonight from you, the audience. And then I must also thank at least 110, if not more of you out there who tuned in for the uh, Insights Lecture tonight. I hope you do agree it's been worth an hour out of your lives to, to hear what you've heard. Um, really do appreciate you joining us though. And just to remind the audience that the Insights Virtual Lecture Series is gonna be taking an Easter break. Um, so the next lecture will actually be on the 27th of April and it'll be a very different topic to that which you've heard tonight. It's the Tyneside Geographical Society Lecture which is why geographers need to stand up for the planet by Zion Lights. 
So uh, we'll look forward to that on Tuesday, the 27th of April. In the meantime, thank you all very much again. Uh, enjoy an Easter break if you can get one um, and uh, stay safe. Bye-bye for now.